But let me give you a little bit of conflict that it was in my life. A couple weeks ago, there's this, the phrase, uh, peace be with your spirit, has been really on my heart. And I had shared this with our pastor's group, uh, and yet I did not know that when I asked for this, this was going to be part of my sermon today. <laughs> I thought it was a great thing because I'm God, you know, I'm worshiping on the way to work this morning. I'm like, God, you know, I just, this word you've given to me that is, Paul kept saying it to people, and I'm like, wow, this is really cool. I want to just ask today, God, give me peace with my spirit. Still worshiping in my car, you know, I mean, you singing when nobody else is around? I mean, you dancing when nobody else is around? You think nobody's watching you? When you pull up to a car beside, and you're like, <laughs> and they just look at you like, yeah, that's just wrong. <laughs> and you roll your window down, they don't roll theirs down. Oh, nobody else does that? I want to, I want to share with Jesus with them, right? Well, on that morning, I think God granted me peace with my spirit until 10 minutes later. <laughs> So I come up to the stoplight. I'm in the left-hand lane. It's like an awkward intersection. People don't always realize there's two lanes there. And so the person in the right-hand lane, cool, we're sitting at the light. And I'm like, just a normal Friday morning. Light turns green. We all cautiously start moving along, except for the car beside me, who decides they want to be in front of me at the same time I'm driving. I back off. They pull in front of me, slam on the brakes. Okay, here we go. All right, Lord. Just back off. Let them do their thing. So I know, you know, know the area pretty well. There's another light not too far ahead of me, less than a quarter of a mile. So I'm just backing off. Just Okay, I'm doing my thing. Get up to the light. There's a left-hand turning lane. There's still two lanes that go straight. Figured this person's going to turn left where I'm going to go. All right, cool. We can go to the same place. I don't care. I can witness to you then for cutting me off. But no, that's okay. Here's what happens. So we get up to that turning lane. They pull juke into the turning lane. Light's green all the time. Just remember this. Green light. What does green light mean? No. If you're in Pennsylvania, what does red light mean? No. <laughs> you lie. <laughs> when it goes yellow, you mean go faster. And red light means hopefully I don't get caught. <laughs> right? You know I'm speaking truth. Now, they pulled in, they juked into that left-hand lane, that turning lane, which was a red arrow, means stop, right? But the green light means go. They pull in there real quick. I got my turn signal on. I'm like, okay, they didn't move up there. They stopped. Then all of a sudden, they jumped back over to the right-hand lane. I'm like, okay. So I figured they're in the right-hand lane. They stopped at the line with the green light. So I'm like, oh, okay, maybe they don't know what they're going. Okay, so I just start into my lane, right? I p- pull up to the line where they're at on the other side, right? And I'm like, I just look over because I'm at the red light, got nothing else to do besides look over to them. I was then greeted with a nice, warm, friendly greeting. And most of you would know that is not a warm and friendly greeting. It's more of a negative and few, like, I'm not sure if I could red lips, but I think I knew what they were saying at the time. Um, Then they sped off. I'm thinking, mm, is that peace with my spirit, Lord? Oh, don't know. I don't think so. But <laughs> hey, you know, God tests you sometimes. He try, gets you through trials and errors and all that kind of stuff, right? I thought that would be the end of it. Like, oh, okay, I, I passed that one, God. Thank you very much. Oh, no. Similar situation happened within the next two hours. Not the same exact, but where somebody cut me off, moved back over to the other lane. I come up beside them. They give me that nice hello gesture again. And then they took off. And it's like, peace with my spirit. You're, you're giving me peace with my spirit while driving. Okay. All right. I love you, Lord. Uh, I know this is one of my challenges because I'm in the car by myself and my anger may come out. I'll be honest. How many of you? Your, your anger comes out when nobody's looking. Some of your subtle suggestions may come out when nobody's looking. I'm just, I'm not judging. I'm not judging. I'm just saying truth, 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 right? But then it got worse. Same day. Two things there. Okay. I get to my office. I was at a job site. Get to my office. 
conflict between me and the shop foreman. Now we're both on kind of in the company wise, we're equal. And um, I was trying to get material to the job size, trying to you know work things out, ask him if he could make something, and it kind of went downhill after that. I'm not going to get into specifics, but there was several, several words that were shared with me in front of other witnesses that were very, very uncalled for. My normal reaction was not to keep what was hidden in the car, but to bring it out. My normal reaction would have been to get up, back up in his face, sharing the same exact words that he might have shared with me. But when you ask God for peace with your spirit and you trust him, he's going to calm your tongue, he's going to calm your mind, he's going to give you the chance to focus to be able to guard yourself and protect yourself. So, the conflict has not been resolved. At least in that circumstance. The conflict has been resolved in me. We'll get to that. But also, so that day, that was just a bad day. It almost, I'll be honest with you, I shared this in another smaller group that I almost lost my sobriety of 11 years that day. That's how stressed I was for asking for peace in my spirit. But God would not let me do it. He reminded me of why I stopped drinking. Not that I can't have a drink, but why I stopped drinking to be an example to others. Not to boast, not to brag, because it's a struggle when you were an alcoholic and to be sober for that long, it's a hard thing to get away from. And it, it always th you think it, you got away from it, sometimes it triggers you. Things, the stress, the problems. How many of you have a stressor in your life that you turn to something other than God? And it could be as simple as a bag of sweet or salty or both. A can of Pepsi or Coke, depending on your flavor choice. You guys understand? There's conflict constantly in our life. And it's whether you, how you choose to resolve it is what it really comes down to. How many times in your life have you harbored past hurts? You may say you've forgiven somebody, but you continually think about the event. Whenever these things happen, does bitterness, bitterness and resentment start building up inside you? I've forgiven them, but... And how many of you continue down that path? I forgive, but... Even as I speak now, an event or circumstance may have came to your mind, right? If not, you're thinking about it now. And there's a point for me to ask you to start thinking about either a recent event or a past event that yet you can't not let go. There's hurts in your life that come out of the unexpected blue. And there's hurts in your life that you won't let go of that continually hurt you, but has no effect on anybody else. So why do we do these things to ourselves? You may even think of somebody that you no longer talk to that you were best friends with for so long because of a past hurt. Let me talk to you a little bit about Jonah. We talk about people with unforgiveness in their life, right? Jonah, do you guys know this story? It's a four-chapter story. It's real short. It's real loving, right? You know, we talk about this big fish thing. They swallowed them up, spit them out. Everybody remembers that part, right? Yeah. Do you know that Jonah had unforgiveness in his heart for Nineveh? If you don't, you do now, right? See, God called him, right? Hey, Jonah, I need you to do something for me, bud. Jonah's like, what's up, Lord? I got this. What you need? I need you to go to Nineveh. No. Short and I'm dim one, my version of it. It's not like ESV or King James, just to let you know. It's the Mark Ghetto style, I guess you could call it. Um, <laughs> but he calls you out and says, hey, Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah ran away from God. Okay, he jumps on a ship, do, 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 storms arise, blah, 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 people throw them off the boat, right? They threw everything else out, they prayed to their gods, 
Guess what? Jonah didn't, wasn't praying to his God to save them. They realized, oh, it was Jonah, right? Toss Jonah over, get swallowed up, right? Get snotted out on the beach. God says, guess what? I'm going to call you again, Jonah. He gives you a second chance, right? Jonah's like, I don't want to. No. I won't do it. I won't eat the broccoli. Tired of broccoli. (laughs) You don't understand about broccoli in my life right now, Lord. So you guess fine. I'll go do this. Jonah gets there with an anger attitude, right? (sighs) Repent for the Lord is near. Yeah, I got 40 days. So what? The people in that are like, this dude said the Lord's going to knock us all out in like 40 days. All right, what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to repent. All right, we're going to pray. We're going we're gonna to sit here in sackcloth and ashes. We're going to do our thing. You know, Jonah's not seeing any of this, right? He's oblivious to this fact. He's sitting in his misery, but God gives him shade. He's kind of happy. The shade goes away. He's miserable again, right? You guys get all this story? But yet God resolved the conflict that Nineveh had prior to Jonah even stepping inside and knowing what was going on. And yet Jonah got angry again because God saved him. How many times have you in your life have been resentful and anger towards somebody, yet they come to know the Lord or come to find peace in their life through the Lord, and yet you're still mad and angry at them? You're no better than Jonah, right? When are you going to declare peace in your life? to resolve the conflicts that you've had, to resolve the issues you may have with one other person or five other people or a whole church. There's people in here today that sit here because of a hurt church, hurt from a church. And I'm, I'm at that point. But I have moved past those points. I have not moved past them. I've moved through them. That's something I've learned recently. Because they have, I have asked for forgiveness. I have given forgiveness, even whenever it wasn't asked for. I've got to move through these things. And God has given me such a resolve over a lot of these things, and I hope that you understand this too. But are you anything like Jonah? You may be a servant of God, a Christ follower, right? But yet you still hold on and harbor things of the past. You may be harboring something right now that you were hurt maybe on your way in today. If you have ill feelings towards someone, that's between you and God. If somebody's hurt you and you haven't gone to seek biblical counsel with them by taking your, your problem to them, you're living within sin. Because you're letting that conflict hold on to you whenever you're given a prescription in which to be healed from this. God does not want you to sit in your sorrow. He wants you to work on letting go of things. Letting go of the past hurts. Does anybody remember Matthew chapter 6? Maybe one or two of you. You know, roughly, let's go around verse, I don't know, 9. Is it starting in Matthew 6, verse 9? Anybody know how this starts? Our Father in heaven. Now, let me read this, okay? Some of you have a different taught version to you. So let me just read this. You guys ready with? Ready? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is heaven, right? Give us this day our daily bread. We're good up to that point. Everybody got that one? Hey, this is the easy one. We know this one. It's the Lord's Prayer. But yet we tend to forget what happens next. You ask for daily bread, but and forgive us our debts. Or trespasses. How many of you were the trespassers, right? Yeah. And also have forgiven our debtors. 
All day long, you can sit there and ask for forgiveness. But when you don't forgive someone else, you forgot the other half of that prayer. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay, we got that. No, I'm not going to skip over that because you can't have that last part without the middle part. When you come and ask for forgiveness, you you are granted it by the grace of God, are you not? And so when you find that the grace of God is upon you, aren't you also to extend grace to those who hurt you? We are, we know that, but do we do it? And if you're new in Christ, you may not know Matthew chapter 6. If you are struggling and you've come to church for a first time and you don't know Christ as your Savior, Matthew chapter 6 may not mean much to you. But I'm speaking to those today that know Christ, that know that Scripture, and yet do not confess before the Lord and do not ask or give for forgiveness. We all have to forgive to be forgiven, according to Mark chapter 11. Wrong tab here, sorry. Mark chapter 11, starting at verse 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Oh, that's, we, like, we can stop there, right? Oh, Lord, give me that new car, that one that's shiny rims, and you got the good tires on it. It's all-wheel drive because of this. I'm not going to talk about the weather. I already said we wouldn't do that again. It's a kid's prayer. Oh, Lord, give me that new fill-in-the-blank. Let's see. It's always a bicycle. It's always a bicycle. But... When we sit there and only think about the small things in life, will God give you the small things in life? Yeah, maybe. Maybe not. That's between you and God. Are you right with Him? Because if you skip the last verse of that, you may not be right with God. Because in verse 25 of Mark chapter 11, it says, And whenever you stand praying, forgive doesn't ask for forgiveness. It says to forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Mark chapter 11 saying, if you don't forgive, you will not receive forgiveness. That's when we sit in grace half this time and go, God, forgive me. And you are sitting here thinking, okay, I'm forgiven. If you're leaving out, you need to forgive someone else. Your forgiveness is sitting there waiting and holding until you forgive. But we don't remember that. We're not being taught that because, well, grace is grace. It spreads throughout everyone. But if we miss the harboring that we keep inside of us and we don't forgive completely, you are not going to receive the grace of forgiveness yourself. Why should you be any different than what Christ is trying to do for you? Are we not to be Christ followers, Christ likeness, your image, imago Dei on you, right? The image of God on you. If the image of God is on you, you have forgiven everyone that has hurt you. But if you don't, you're going to look like you. And if you look like me, you're going to struggle. You're just thankful that somebody kept you for 20-some years now. You don't have to worry about your image. But some of you, you may have an ugly side, right? I know, I said the U word. I should not say the U word in church. None of you are ugly. I'm not talking physically. I'm talking spiritually and emotionally inside that you may be ugly on the inside because you have harbored so much inside of you. I preach out of example. There's a lot of ugliness that's been inside of me. Just because you ask forgiveness doesn't mean it's a pass. It's not a get out of jail free card. 
It's a, you're going to sit there until you, if you play Monopoly like we do, you can cheat and buy your way out of jail, all right? I mean, you can, but sometimes we just make it a little bit higher, charge a little bit more. Dealer's choice, should we call it? We do things differently. But we all have to be f- to forgive to be forgiven. We all have to ask for forgiveness to equally forgive. So in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, 1 through 4, it says, And he said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. Okay? It doesn't mean you go around saying, you sin, you sinner, you sinner, you sinner, you sinner. Well, guess what? What are we all? So all we're going to walk around town and call everybody a sinner? But if they rebuke, if you rebuke it and help them move past it, right? It's not a public thing. I'm going to call somebody out in their sin. It's a one-on-one. It's a helping hand. And if he repents, guess what you should do? No, forgive him. <laughs> yes, rejoice. Through your forgiveness. Okay. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must? Yes, yeah, so there we got that one. Somebody sins against you, hurts you, harms you in any way. Guess what? Forgive them if they ask for it. Or should you just forgive no matter what? Why is that? Why do we not do that? Some of you are a lot better than others. It's taken me uh, years to reach out to somebody and ask for forgiveness, even though I felt I did no wrong. When the Lord laid it on my heart, I had to respond. Because I don't know what I may have done to somebody. And as a relationship, I wanted to not move past, but to see healing come from it, at least from my side. Because I've forgiven, but I've also needed to ask for forgiveness. We all have to ask for forgiveness and to equally forgive. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verses 5 through 11. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, but they cause pain to all of you, okay? For such a one, this is punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him Or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. You see this? Quick to forgive heals somebody else. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote that I may test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. See, Paul is just saying, hey, you forgive them, I got your back because I'm going to do the same. It's, it's like you're working for me, not against me. Like, I got, your, I got your back, you forgive them, and I forgive them also. And if we could ask Paul today, I bet you said, if you don't forgive them, I will. But he wants to make this emphasis to them really clear. Indeed, what I have forgiven if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. See that? Paul's taken more upon himself so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. You guys clear on this? If we are not forgiving and we're not allowing forgiveness to happen, Satan has every right to that circumstance in your life. 
that's a stronghold on you. It's not on the other person, it's on you. Because when you have unforgiveness in your heart, it's the cancer, right? It's the cancer of your soul. It's tearing you apart. It's pulling you piece by piece and stretching you in different ways that you don't need to be stretched. There's a time in your life in which forgiveness needs to happen so that you can start healing. We all can be enlightened if we remove our sin. We cannot do it. Only God can. But this exposes us to struggles and sufferings. You go, why on earth would I want to do that? Well, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 through 39. Why on earth would I want to create more struggle and strife for myself? Okay, I forgive them, Lord. Isn't that enough? No, because you didn't forgive them quickly enough. Or you didn't fully forgive them. So which is it? So in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32, But recall the former days, when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better position and an an abiding one. Let's stop there for a second. When you do all these things, you're going to struggle, but it's for God's sake to strengthen you in your faith. Okay, you forgive a little. Okay, great. You're going to struggle a little. You forgive a lot. Hopefully, you still sh- struggle a little. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, you're not tormented, right, and divided in that. Because you don't want to blame God for any of this, but he will give you struggles in which you will need to handle. It's going to give you more than probably you can handle. Because that's what the stretching's for. That's what the faith is for. Why can we not focus on strengthening our faith and letting go of this thing that's eating away at us? We let this conflict tear us away from what God really wants. He wants you whole and in him. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Hmm. But if we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. We might be insane to seek God's will by asking for forgiveness for ourselves, but then you may be insane to also ask and grant, not ask, but to grant forgiveness to others. But I was the one that was hurt. So, get over yourself. (laughs) It's not the way to say that, right? Why don't you say, I need to forgive so that I can heal. Not move past it, but to understand the circumstance. To try to seek retribution, not retribution, resolve in this. Because we are to take our problems with a brother or sister to them. Do you guys understand this concept? Scriptural. 100% scriptural. If somebody has caused you offense... You were actually supposed to put down your offerings before God and go to them and seek resolution. And if they don't grant your resolution, you don't come back, pick up the offerings, put it in. You leave them there. You get a mutual friend, and you do this together. And if you don't have a resolve from that, you are absolved from that issue. If they will not settle the circumstance... You've done everything God has told you to do, and you are to forgive and let go. Because there's people in your life that will not accept forgiveness. Do not want to seek resolution. I watched it today, and if you know anything about the Joker, he, some people just want to watch the world burn, right? There's Jokers in your life. 
But who do they need? They need God just like you do. They have a risen Savior just like you do. They have a chance for the Holy Spirit if they seek Jesus like you do. I'm sure you're not sitting here today just because you wanted to have fun and hear me preach. I bet you're sitting here today because you have a like-mindedness of wanting to know more about Christ. Or if you don't know about Christ, you're trying to seek out who this Christ is. Martin Luther King once said this, Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a constant attitude. Something I learned within the last year that I strive for each and every day. It's a PMA. If you don't know what a PMA is, it's a positive mental attitude. I'm one of those people that once I see a negative thing, I start harping on it. That's not healthy, no matter what the situation is. And so I try to be that positive person in everybody's life. I'm not always good at it. But sometimes I'm just worn out. But then those are the days that God sends me somebody. I look back over my life and say, well, Lord, Have I forgiven that person for that situation? If I haven't, help me. I told you about a conflict of somebody else having a conflict with me, and I'm just finding out about it. I've extended the olive branch, the scriptural olive branch, of how let's get this resolved, let's talk about this and work this out. My prayer is this, that they accept and that we work this situation out. I don't want them to have conflict in their life and no unforgiveness in their life. But at the same time, it's not the conflict I have. How many times do you know that somebody is harboring something against you and you haven't offered the option of just talking about it? I never thought of that side before. That if somebody has something against you that you know about, and you, you thought it was resolved and it's not, reach out. It's not on your heart, but if you've already forgiven them, but they haven't forgiven you, reach out. That's the harder side, I think, of it. Because you're like, oh, that's their problem, not mine. I'm good. Well, if that's your attitude towards it, guess what? It is your problem. Because we're supposed to forgive all. We're supposed to seek forgiveness. And it's a twofold. It's not a single one-way street. You understand this? So we must be insane to want to talk about these things. To want to seek out forgiveness. And to forgive those that have hurt us. Whether they know they've hurt us or not. Some will just not accept it. Be okay with that, but knowing that you've done it for the Lord and that He's called you to ask for forgiveness and to forgive. Why do you want to hold on to it, let it hurt you, and keep hindering you from your full potential? All heads bowed, eyes closed. I know at the beginning I asked you all, If you've brought something in with you today. If you're harboring something of the past, or even most recently. If that your first words or first thought of somebody that has hurt you is negative and mean and rude. This is a time that you need to get right with God. Seek out what He wants you to do. He wants you to forgive. He wants you to heal. But why do you want to keep holding on to these things? If you have no conflict in your life, please see me afterwards. I want to know what the peace of life is. But we all, I think, struggle with a conflict within ourselves of a past hurt or something we've done to somebody in the past. 
So, Father, today as all of your people are here and we are just thinking, Lord, what can we do to seek the resolution, to find the resolve in the circumstance and the situation so that we can be released from the chain of prison in which this unforgiveness is holding us in. That we're not a martyr like Paul, but more like Barabbas was, a true prisoner, a murderer. Because when we still have hate in our hearts, Lord, you've told us that it is like killing somebody, like murdering. Unforgiveness of somebody is just that. It's a harboring of hate. It may be a low form, Lord, of hate, but Lord, it is still that. And you've told us to move past that through the word of forgiveness. So, Lord, today, if there's anyone in here that is in this situation that they can't move past the situ- move through the situation to understand who you are and what you want us to do, let them be recognized by you today of the cir- circumstance and situation in which they need your help. And that their faith strengthening can come from a healing of this. that relationships need to be restored and renewed in your name today, Father. We cannot do this alone. We need the power of your Holy Spirit in us. So help us today, Father. Help us to be renewed and in your strength. 